he wasn't closed, he was open, he wasn't aggressive in any way, but he said, I just want to really explain something to you. I don't know if I believe, I'm very skeptical. And I'm open-minded, I'm here, but you're gonna to have to give me some really tangible stuff. And I was like, oh, no pressure. <laughs> Just start gentle with me, let the spirit world unfold. I said, you, it won't happen in the first second. Just watch what they do. And then they revealed this incredible story of a robbery and a, a murder. And a, he said, I know you for real. I know, I know this, everything you're saying is, is, is real. He went, I'm just, and he looked relieved and he, he, he's had a shift. Hi everybody, welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. I'm so thrilled that you're with us today because we have Kat Bailey with us. You guys are gonna love, 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 love her. And you're gonna see why in just a second. She's a psychic medium and she's a riot. She's so much fun. And we're gonna we're gonna talk all things mediumship and how talking with deceased loved ones can help us in every area of our lives. Just wanted to remind you, my intention in doing this show is to provide information, insight, and comfort to people all over the world by helping to answer life's unanswerable questions. So Kat, welcome to the show, girl. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm here as a British representative today. I'm here from the UK, London, and I'm thrilled. Thank you so much for having me, Judy. It's such a privilege. You bet. We both are involved in the Helping Parents Heal organization. And so we know lots of people in common. And when we first started chatting before we started recording, Kat goes, okay, I've heard a lot about you. <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, Lord, here we go. But hopefully it's been all good. Oh, it's really good. But I, I heard that you kick ass. <laughs> that you, <laughs> you say it as it is, you're direct and you're to the point and you're thorough. And I like that about you. So I heard, I heard good things, Julie. I heard good things. Oh, good, good. All right. So let's just get right into it. As a medium, you have, you seem to have a particular calling to help the bereaved. Yeah. How did that come about? And why, why that area of mediumship? Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Uh, I've got a big heart. I've always been very drawn by my heart and a very heart-centered person. I think my mum's a very loving person. I'm going to blame her. <laughs> She's a very loving and generous person and a big heart and has always taught me and my sister to really love from the heart. And so I think it was ingrained in me from a very young age to be very kind and loving towards people and to be polite and courteous and to listen and hold space for people. Later in life, I, I lost two babies. I lost uh, in, in, in one in the latter stages of pregnancy. And I, I think it gave me a different level of empathy or compassion. My sister had also had miscarriage before she went on to have two lovely children. And, um, and actually my first sort of meeting of a medium was actually when my sister lost, uh, lost a child. And so I had these little, you know, little soul plan, little droplets that had been dropped into my life. I wasn't mediumistic. I was, I'd say I had some really amazing experiences when I was 13 or 14 years old. Things that I'd written off as coincidences or kind of, um, you know, just kind of thought, that's really weird. It was really sort of in my early 30s, I had a diving accident, a, a really um, severe traumatic experience. I actually suffered post-traumatic stress. I found it very humbling. I was a leader in the fashion industry. I was ahead of my game in terms of retail. I, I was enjoying very sort of high-end kind of meetings, getting opportunities to work with like the board members and kind of meet really amazing creative people that worked in my industry. And, and and amazing suppliers as well. Amazing people worked alongside us that didn't actually work for the company. And I was just in this magical world. And suddenly, for the first time ever, I can't cope. I'm I I almost felt humiliated by it. It was a very humbling experience, Julie, to feel that I was having panic attacks, I was having shakes, I couldn't sleep at night, I had insomnia, I'd never suffered from insomnia. I didn't even know what a panic attack was the first time I experienced it. I thought I was having a heart attack. Um, I was on the tube. I literally, and the diving accident had happened a couple of weeks before. So I had this kind of delayed reaction. I got on the tube in London and suddenly the claustrophobia of other people sort of stimulated the same kind of experience of being trapped in water. And I literally melt, had a meltdown. I, I literally, I think I nearly blacked out. I literally was helped to the side of the kind of pathway. And 
it started a journey. And, and again, you know, as I look back in terms of soul planning, I can see spirit's wisdom in that, you know, a lot of the people in the community that you and I serve, whether they realize it or not, they've been exposed to maybe very challenging situations in terms of maybe they've had a child that's had cancer and they've had to take really difficult decisions about certain treatments and things that they've been thrown into the unknown. They don't really know what they're dealing with. They're trying to feel their way all the way, educate themselves, juggle work, other siblings. They've got a lot going on life. It's a, it's a hard situation to be in. And they're, they're traumatized, but they haven't had time to kind of consider that they've just got to keep going because they've got a child that's got cancer and they've got other siblings and family members they've got to keep going and so they find this sort of level of adrenaline within themselves and they run on that adrenaline and it's only really after the child passes and a period of grief has happened when the crash happens you know this delayed reaction and some of them will have panic attacks some of them will have post-traumatic stress some of them will have all the symptoms that I had but what is really interesting is that and this is really unusual for me because I wouldn't say that my family were very holistic in approach to medicine. They were very traditional in approach to medicine. You go to a doctor, you get a prescription, you take the drugs. When this happened to me, I went the opposite way, which I have no idea where this came from. Again, it might have just been the intuition, or it could have been the soul planning, I don't know. I went for every therapy that you could do that was holistic. So I did yoga, breath work. I did traditional talk therapy. I did hypnotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy. I tried everything. And the two things that really, really worked very successfully was cognitive behavior therapy. Within three weeks, I stopped the panic attacks. And I did that just through educating myself. And one session here of hypnosis completely transformed my sleep. I literally slept like a baby from this moment onwards, just by re-educating my mind how it perceived the diving accident. So I didn't take away the emotions, I didn't take away the memory, I didn't lose any memory. I just reformulated how I see that image and I still look at it in a very different way. And so I realized the power of the mind uh, and and I think I found my spirit through these experiences. And it was only really when I was thrown into work, because I was an affiliate leader for Helping Parents Heal for several years, um, uh, four or five years at the beginning of my journey with them. And again, through a strange sight of synchronicity, actually, you know, uh, somebody had to leave and, and Elizabeth said, could you hold the fort? And I thought I was going to hold the fort for a couple of months and I ended up staying a couple of years. Um, and it was really, you know, I, I'm kind of really thankful for that organisation on many, many levels because Irene, Elizabeth, these amazing people like Brian and all these other people like Paige Lee and other people that I've met that were affiliate leaders at the time, they educated me on a different level of their experiences of grief. So Irene taught me about what it's like to lose a child from cancer. Um, Elizabeth taught me about how what it's like to lose somebody very suddenly in, a, in an incident, an accident. Her son died in the Himalayas, you know, away from home. She only had a very short period of time to talk to him. Paige's son was murdered. And through those people, they helped really bring a different level of compassion to my life. Mark Island as well was very influential and coached me and mentored me a lot, especially because I was an English person working in America, in the UK. And so he sort of helped me understand what it was like for him when he lost his son. And and then through doing the affiliate work, you know, several, you know, 24, 25,000 people in the group or something, I, I spent a lot of time one-to-one -one listening to people, spending time with people, talking to people, and felt my way, really, learned from my experiences. And I think it broke open a very different level of compassion in me because suddenly you take your work a lot more seriously. You know, I hadn't trained to be a medium uh, or, or wanted to be a medium, sorry, I was very successful in, in my in my fashion industry career. And Spirit actually asked me if I would leave my job. <laughs> and I sort of laughed at them saying, you know, what, two days? I even negotiated a two-day contract, believe it or not, in the attempt that I would, oh, I can do a bit of this, I can do a bit. And they were like, no, it's a full-time job. 
you got to leave. And I, I thought they were joking. So I, I took a gap year. I thought, oh, I'll take a gap year and I'll go back to work in a year's time. It'll be fine. Whatever it is that they want to do, it can't be that serious, you know, whatever. Let's let's see. And I didn't take it seriously. And actually spirit berated me a little bit for that at first. They were like, you don't really understand the seriousness of what you're taking on unfold. And that's something that I want to touch on in a minute, actually. Um, and it was a steep learning curve. I'm, I'm not going to lie. It was a really steep learning curve, dealing with the levels of grief. But I am an educator. And so I learned to how to educate myself out of trauma when I had the diving accident. So I threw myself into grief courses, grief education. Um, I literally read books. I listened to, I sat and did, you know, chat rooms every week, listening to people. Um, and that just, the more I spent time with people, one thing I do love, and I've always been good at, even in the fashion industry, I love people. <laughs> I love I love stories. I love characters. I love personality. And I come alive when I'm bouncing off people or listening to people. And I've got, I've got a good sense. Of, I think I've got a good sense of humor. I've got a wicked laugh, a signature laugh that, that is quite contagious. And sometimes spirit will come in and they'll emphasize it a bit more to like make somebody laugh even more it's very contagious and so I use my sense of humor and my human traits to kind of elevate people and raise energy as well it's not just about the mediumship it's about my personality and who I am and I think I love lifting people up I love bringing people into the fray I love hugging them I love caring for them and I I like to see them go on their way as well I like to I know I've done a good job if they're not coming to me anymore <laughs> Well, because they're okay. That 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 that's brilliant news yeah. for me. Or I've taught them like yourself, because I know that you educate and you teach people how to get connection themselves. I love it when they get connection themselves and they come to me excited about. Oh, you'll never believe what's happened. And I'm like, I'm having this conversation, and I'm like, still got this amazing connection with my loved one, and they were telling me this, and you know, some people ring me up and they'll tell me, you know, oh, I know you've been doing this because Kyle was telling me that you were doing this, this, and this, or. So and so, you know, my 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 daughter was saying to me that you were doing this this week. Is that true? Is that really true? And I'd be like, Oh my god, <laughs> you're better than me. I think we better. I think we better swap places. But here, here's kind of what I wanted right. to get to, though. I think all joking aside, the grief work is amazing, and I love it. And I think because of my connection with a, a dear friend of mine, Paige Lee, it's become another level of work for me. And I've been helping her on a project that started, which I'll share a little bit more about in a moment, um, called Transcending Grief. Um, and I think what we've realized is that you can touch people, but even if you're five years into grief, 10 years in grief, you have days where waves come over you and you just want to, um, you need contact with people. You know, it's not just about contact with spirit. You need contact with one another. And I think spirit very good at connecting, you know, the living together, not just not just the disincarnate there so I think that's where I can this level of grief sort of work came from it came from actually just being in the community and spending time with people and falling in love with people really so you know some people don't take mediumship seriously and I I, I really think I come from a place like you do Julie of loving compassion where you've got to hold people in space and you've got to do a good job girl because these people need you and you've got a responsibility. And I think connection, we, we both teach connection and connection's amazing, but there's a far difference between connecting for somebody in front of you who is just a friend or somebody who's come to have a, a great experience and they're on a good, the same level as you, or they're a, you know, you can have a really good laugh with a glass of wine in hand and you, you're bringing through loved ones and you're having this moment, that's, that's beautiful. But there's another layer to it, and that is that you're dealing with high traumatic states and you don't want to traumatise people more. You want to try to help them in any way you can or get them to the support structures that are going to help them, whether that's a therapist, whether that's a doctor, whether that's a, a healer, whether it's a hypnotherapist, a CBT psychotherapist. There's a referral system that goes on, and I think I'm very grateful for knowing a lot of great people who will scoop people up and will help them go through these awful situations. But, you know, it's like one of my students said to me, it's, and I haven't really fully unpacked this yet, actually. She came to me a couple of weeks ago and said, you know, 
I've been studying mediumship for a long time, Kat, and I've been a fledgling. I've done all the groundwork in mediumship, you know, 10, 15 years of study. It's a long time. And then she started to be a professional medium and she's come back to me and she's like, I don't know if this job's for me. I said, what do you mean? She said, I'm, I'm so like shocked by what I'm experiencing. And I said, I know it's, it's, it's freaking hard going, isn't it? It's like people's lives are really diverse and some things that happen to people you know, I'd never experienced in my life. I've never experienced some of the stories that I sit and I listen to and I, from spirit and from the person in front when they give feedback and, and sort of reveal more of the intricacies of what the spirit world have been talking to them about. Because you have to be aware. We're, we're both passive, aren't we? We're listening to spirit. We're repeating what they say or the impressions that come into our mind. And then, and then we get this unpacking or this kind of feedback at the end about the full story. And it's often even more intricate than the story that spirit have unfolded for you. So I, I think you've got to take a lot of responsibility if you're going to go into this line of work. It's not, you know, there are days where there's a lot of laughter and there's hilarity and you get a really big personality that comes through and they rip the mick out of their, you know, best friend or their mother and you have a really good laugh and you're rolling around laughing, they're laughing. The person in front of you is laughing and you think, oh my God, this is like the elixir of life. But then there are other days like today, I'm absolutely shattered today, where the whole day is heavy lifting work. And I'm talking heavy lifting emotions, heavy lifting in terms of um, energy. You're, you're pulling that energy into yourself. You're trying to pull it up, spit it back out, use spirit's energy <laughs> to kind of really elevate your energy to be able to elevate theirs. And, you know, I feel very fortunate that the thing that gives me the buzz in what I do, if you if you want to say it's a buzz, I don't know if it is a buzz, it's just this beautiful feeling in my heart centre, is and why I do the job, because I, I really believe, Julie, that every spirit that touches us, they leave a little bit of their soul and a little bit of light in our soul. and And that, for me, is what's really special because I think it changes our light. I think it changes who we are because we learn through their experiences and that connection is very, very important to me. I think that's what can help you ascend or change into a higher vibrational being because you're allowing other people's light to affect your light and expand yours in, in some way through this lovely connection that you have. And so Really, if we can do our jobs properly and we can connect the living to have a better life experience with the trauma that they've gone through, then we're doing a good job. Um, I don't I agree. count myself. I, agree. I don't have credit for any of that. I really do credit to spirit as well. I, I don't have any ego. I really believe I'm only as good as the spirit world of that what they give me on any given day. And, and you know, some days you walk into the office, you have amazing readings. Some days you can't make a connection and you don't know why. You know, I've had some very interesting stories about that as well, where, you know, I've had, I had a lady in New York once I went to read for, and she was amazing, lovely energy, got on really well. And I'd have three or four readings that day. They'd all been fantastic. But when she sat in front of me, I said, I can't read for you. <laughs> I just don't know why I can't read for you. And then so what happens in that situation when you aren't, when you aren't getting the connection with the person with whom you're working and their, their deceased loved one? It really depends on the person, Julie. Sometimes I think, okay, I'll just reschedule in this situation. I just rescheduled the person next week. I said, I know I can read for you. There's something else going on. And here's the amazing thing. And I don't want to say that this is always what's going to happen um, because I don't want to traumatize anyone. But the next day, her mum, who was very healthy, completely healthy. And this is why I say there's divine timing to everything. She had a heart attack and she died. And the first person through the following Monday was her mother. And so spirit knew oh, the wow. greatest spirit knew the greatest need. So my connection, you could argue, was it my fault? It might have been, but I don't think it was on that occasion. I think the lack of connection was so that I read for her the following week when the need was the greatest. Yeah. Um, I've had it. Spirit also, was delaying the appointment. They were delaying. Yeah, spirit the was delaying the appointment. So, yeah. but, and, yeah. and then I had another lady in Florida. I'll never forget. I can't remember if it was her that changed the appointment or me. And she and she got promoted, and they wanted to celebrate this promotion with her. And so it was the opposite. It was hilation and oh, congratulations. I hear you got a new job, and they're all oh, they're rubbing their hands. Then you you've been wanting this promotion for a long time, and 
you know, complete opposite kind of dimension of reality. It was about celebration. So yeah, there, there is, there's a weird, I mean, it's just a fascinating. I can't explain it. There's no rhyme or reason sometimes to anything, is there? But you just have to trust that there's a higher rhyme or reason that perhaps you just don't know about. <laughs> it's just a tiny little glit right. in the heart right. side of the cosmos. Right. Well, do you think that everybody is born with the ability and do you think anybody and everybody can become a medium? What, what's your take on that? Yeah, here's my take on that. I believe that everybody can have connection, that everybody is born with connection. We're born with the breath, the spirit, and that breath comes with us when we're born and it goes with us when, when we when we transition. And so that spirit, that light, that is with every single person, doesn't matter whether they're able-bodied or not, that, that light is, it, we, it's the apparatus that makes us breathe. That we don't breathe. I've had experiences where spirit have asked me to drop out of my body and go backwards, which I didn't think I could do. I've only got half out. <laughs> like, and I, and I realized that I, my fear was, would my, if I, if my spirit went out of body, would my body breathe? And it did. And I was like, oh, <laughs> it's not me that's breathing it. That's a bit. I know we know that, but it's like when you actually feel it and you experience it, it's a really weird sensation. So um, I I believe that everybody has spirit. I believe that we all have a soul and that soul, you know, has uh, an ability to tap in and connect. Is everybody a medium? I'm not sure because of what I've discussed earlier that everybody is because the level of compassion that you really need if you're doing the job properly, you need more skills than just connection, Julie. You need to be able to manage grief and to be able to find the skill set in terms of communication, to be able to support and hold space for people, both in spirit and in living. Because sometimes the spirit have got big subject matters that they want to talk about as well. It's not just about the living. We serve a large part. I don't know how you feel about this. I often feel that I serve the spirit world first. And the person in front of me, I have a duty of care to, but the spirit world is, you know, I have a responsibility to them as well. So I think there's a big responsibility in this job role, if you, if you will. And I, like I said, you know, I... I when my students said, I don't know if it's for me, I said, don't give up yet because you are, you know, sometimes being a medium means you get kicked in the stomach 24 seven. You are dealing with so many sort of situations and it takes a while to build up the strength and the energy as well to cope with what's in front of you in any given day. So I don't think that's for everybody, Julie. I, I, I think some people are meant to be doctors, some people are meant to be nurses, some people are meant to be mediums, some people are meant to work in fashion industry. Maybe some of us are meant to do both. You know, I have a friend, Bob, who, you know, had an everyday job and then he does a bit of mediumship on the side. He's brilliant at it. He's got a balance. He doesn't, he can't do it every day, every day because it's exhausting, but he can tap into it every, you know, uh, when he feels inclined or his spirit tells him to. Um, so I think we're all connected. I don't know if we're all mediums. I don't know how you feel about that. I, do, I don't know if you agree. I, I agree. I, th I think it comes in with practice. And I think that in our business with mediumship, sometimes it's just so overcomplicated from an un unnecessarily so standpoint. You know, yeah. you don't, I find and I teach, you don't need to meditate for two hours. No, and I agree. Or three I'm, times I'm... and raise your right hand and jump on your left foot in order to connect with spirit. You learn how to turn it on and off. And the key really is practice. Yeah, more than absolutely. anything, the more you do it, the more validation you get, the more validation you get, the more you trust it. And then it just becomes second nature and you turn it on and off at will. Doesn't, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do this. And everybody comes in with the ability. It's, but that's been my experience, Kat, yeah, me too. especially little children. We talk to little children and they, they know this stuff. You know, they talk yeah, the about I've that been. they're talking to their, yeah, to their to their deceased great granddad who was dead long before this child was ever born. And this child knows things about this person who lived that the child can't read yet and the child never met the person, but yet they know all this information. How do you mm -hmm. how do you make that up? Yeah. You can't. Do you know what? 
do you, do you know what I love as well? I have a very spiritual builder. He's my best friend. He comes to the house occasionally and we talk spirit. We talk, we talk all sorts, but he yeah. thinks my life's a you bit talk crazy. Well, well. Yeah, we talk woo woo. <laughs> um, and, um, and we have those funny moments where we unpack our week, you know, his in the building world and mine in the spirit world. And we laugh to the pit of our stomach sometimes. And sometimes we're like, we're too exhausted to speak. We just stare at each other and have coffee. Um, but, you know, he, he'll come and he'll tell me about experiences that he's had. And he's, you know, he's not a trained medium. He's got, and he's wanting to ask. He's wanting, what, what is this? What What's happening to me? Why did I have this experience? Why was I talking to my father and my grandfather who transitioned in my sleep, you know, and, and he's like, is it real? <laughs> you know, and he, I love it. It's, it's, you know, and so I think it happens to more people than you think, Julie, and we just yeah, don't talk agree. about it very frequently. So I, I agree, we're all connected. And I think the magic in little children when they, you know, the amount of kids that all talk very innocently, to their loved one and you know my my niece had an invisible friend for several years and my sister's like mm -hmm. I don't know if it's invisible or not Kat I don't she is very in she comes back with information that she couldn't possibly know or create <laughs> you know it's just you know so we get these fascinating sort of insights don't we I, I think it's magical I I think everybody can you know in terms of grief and wanting to connect to a loved one I think when the love is present and you, if there is a desire to connect, you can. You're connected all the time. You can't be unconnected. I, I think you're right when we say people overcomplicate things, don't they? It's one of my bugbears. It's like, oh, God's sake, if spirit want to talk to you, they can talk to you in your everyday life. You don't need to sit, meditate or kind of, you just need to, you just need to ask. You need to give them permission. You need to open your heart to experiences. And it might not be a voice in your head. It might be a sign in front of you. It, uh, somebody sent me a brilliant one the other day. Um, their son in spirit. He, uh, I can't remember his first name, but he was from a cancers, and his first name is quite unusual. I think it's Sawyer, and the and the back of the car said a cancers Sawyer, <laughs> and it was the white Chevy that he drives, and. If there were so many things in the sign that, you know, the average person would go, oh, it's just a coincidence. But then the mum's going, hang on a minute. It's a white Chevy. That was his, that was his car. <laughs> it's his name. He was from a Kansas. Oh my gosh. Like, I've just got a sign. Ah! <laughs> like this, you know, and I, I'm like, yeah. oh, that's, a, you, you can't, I mean, you just can't make that up. Can you? It's like, it's, and it's private. It's her private. It doesn't really matter what other people think. It's her private moment. It's amazing, I think. Well, and, and I, I was just talking with someone earlier this morning about how we all get that information from spirit and most people will discount it. They'll say, oh, that's just my, I'm making that up or that didn't really happen or there's another explanation for it. And I always say, is that first thing that comes into your head as fast as you can snap your fingers or yeah. before because time doesn't exist in the spirit world and it's that first thought that comes in I had a I have a graduate of my class named Angie and her mom died a week ago um. and then I was talking with her a couple of days ago Kat and she said I was cooking dinner and a spoon flew across the kitchen oh, wow. by itself. She said her brother was in the room too. And she said to her mom, her mom's spirit, she goes, mom, don't you think you're being a little dramatic? <laughs> well, the next thing she realized was her oven was on fire. Oh, wow. Do you know that happened? And so they, they put the fire out and then she said, okay, mom, I understand why you were being dramatic. You needed to get my attention. Yeah. I know why you're telling me that that's story on two, on two accounts. That's really uncanny. I actually left the house the other day and I was in such a buzz about something. Sat in the car and I just put the car on and suddenly I was like, I don't think I've turned the oven off. And I thought, oh no, it's just, no, I haven't turned the oven off. I heard spirits say, go back into the house. <laughs> I just went, shut the door, went back into the house. And I was like, oh my gosh, I nearly left. God, don't tell my husband. I nearly left without like turning the oven off. That is really frightening. But the spoon story makes me smile. There's a young man in, in, in spirit called Nicholas. His mum is traveling around the world at the moment with his father. And um, it was, they, they'd been, they'd won some kind of meal and they'd been invited to this restaurant and um, they were sat down for dinner and um, they were thinking, gosh, wouldn't it be really nice if Nicholas was here? We always loved going out for dinner with him. And when the waitress came over, the table wasn't laid and she laid out the cutlery and she set three places. 
And they sort of looked and they were like, she set three places. <laughs> There's only two of us sat at this table. And they sort of smiled. They didn't sort of say anything. And um, anyway, they were, I think the meal was supposed to be two courses, like a starter and a main. But she said, oh, we would like to treat you to a, des- a free dessert. Now, her, their son's favourite dessert uh, was, uh, I think it was uh, a creme caramel. And they realised that on this, you know, dessert menu of three items was a creme caramel. So they thought, oh, we'll order that for Nick and we'll share. We're not hungry enough to have one each. We'll just share one. Just bring us two shit spoons and we'll share. And, and you know, they've since unpacked the, they've done, they've taken away the cutlery from the three settings and just put it down as two and left the cutlery at the side. But sure enough, she comes back and she lays out three spoons for the creme caramel. And they were like, it was just so uncanny that we had to say to her, you know, this is really weird. We've kind of been gifted this opportunity to be here. And, you know, we were saying we, we lost our son in really tragic circumstances. We were just saying we would really love it. He would love to be here. And every time you come to the table, you set three places or three spoons. And they, they took a photo. They sent me of the creme caramel with the three spoons on it. And they kept saying to the waitress, like, why did you do that? And she couldn't explain. She said, I had no idea. I didn't, I wasn't even consciously aware that I did it. And I, I think that's one of those moments where spirit have used her as a conduit to sort of say, I'm there. I'm there. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, changing directions for a minute, I find that in America, maybe we're a bit behind other countries that are older and the cultures are older. Certainly in the UK, you guys have like the London Seance Society that's ancient and you have the, you have the London Psychic Institute and the Arthur Finley School and Dickens and Shakespeare and Harry (laughs) Potter, for heaven's sakes. What do you think that it has been your experience that people in older cultures and older countries perhaps around the world are more accepting of the spirit world and how spirit communicates with us and all of that than perhaps what I find people in America. Certainly there's a percentage of people, but I would say the overall thing, you know, the, the overall sentiment in America is everybody knows, everybody intuitively, I think, innately knows that there's most likely something after we die, but it's not something that they want to talk about. What's mm-hmm. been your experience? And I know you, like I, work with people all over the world. So what's yeah. been your experience with that? I, do you know, I love this. I love this subject in terms of perception. I think England's the same as America. I think only a small percentage of people have unpacked this subject really? matter. Yeah. I think we've really? got, we've got okay. the most amazing colleges. We've got the amazing... I bet you, if you ask the Joe public, the standard person, when I say to my sister, I'm going to the Arthur Finley College, she doesn't have a clue what I'm talking about. You know, and yeah. and yet if I talk to Americans, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so well, I, within a certain within a segment certain in the Arthur Finley. Yeah, you're right, within a certain yeah, yeah, community. Yeah. Within a certain and the, community. Arthur, the Arthur Finley the Arthur Finlay College, for those of you that don't know, it's kind of like a modern day Harry Potter it school. It's, it's like a modern like day Hogwarts. Hogwarts. It, it has got the yeah. nickname. It's like it's Hogwarts. Hogwarts. It is. It's Hogwarts. But when I started my journey, I started at um, Conan Doyle's house, which used to be 33 Belgrave Square. In, um, oh, wow. And he is the author of Sherlock Holmes. He is, my, my husband works sure. on Baker Street. <laughs> um, um, he is, he is the, he is the, um, you know, he was one of the biggest writers on 19th century on that spiritualism. He actually lost his son and he went in search of the truth. He wanted to, you know, he's got a phrase that he says, you know, when you've, you've kind of searched every other possibility, what you're left with ultimately has to be the truth. And he, explored everything and he came to this conclusion that there definitely is more to life and um and he's a very educated man and i think i think people that have had their lives ripped open by grief and have come to experience quite challenging circumstances in those moments they're willing to take a bit of a leap and try to understand a little bit more And so I think you get, like you do in America and all over the world, a percentage of people who 
become very open minded, even if that window of open mindedness is for a short period of time, they're willing to explore or question, it maybe is the first time they've ever thought about this subject matter, if I'm really honest. And I certainly, before the diving accident, didn't really give this much thought. I was I wouldn't say I wasn't interested in it. I'd had exposure because of my sister to it, but I hadn't really gone into the depth of it in the way that I am now. And I, I think it's the same. I think there are a lot of very sceptical people who haven't, even if they've had their own experiences, they want to kind of brush it off. You know, I, I read for a young man a few weeks ago, and he's actually become quite a dear friend of, um, and he he'd lost his stepfather in very tragic circumstances, but quite a number of years ago, um, he'd taken maybe a, a decade, two decades to find me, <laughs> you know, and came very sceptical. He wasn't closed. He was open. He wasn't aggressive in any way, but he said, I just want to really explain something to you. I don't know if I believe. I'm very sceptical. And I'm open-minded. I'm here. But you're going to have to give me some really tangible stuff. And I was like, no pressure. <laughs> Just start gentle with me. Let the spirit world unfold. I said, you, it won't happen in the first second. Just watch what they do. And then they revealed this incredible story of a robbery and a, a murder. And, a, you know, this young man didn't look as if he'd had this life experience. He looked very well put together. And I, I was actually really shocked when this sort of bigger picture unfolded. And he said, I know you for real. I know, I know this. Everything you're saying is 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 real. And he went, I'm just and he looked relieved and he he he's had a shift. And it, it's taken him that long to have the courage to find that moment. I think we all come to it when we're supposed to. I don't think this is something that you can force on people. I think they have to have that leveling of inquiry and they have to decide the timing that's right for him. 20 years after the moment was the right moment for him. For somebody else, it might be the very next day or the very moment somebody's passed or a month later, a year later. It is different for every single person, I think, Julie. I think we... You know, we've got to be compassionate to ourselves. We've got to be compassionate to each other. Different people come to it in different times. I agree. Well, and I do a lot of medical healing, medical oh, yeah, energetic healing. And yeah, and and people oftentimes will come to me when they're desperate because they've been to multiple doctors and gotten multiple diagnoses and treatment plans and they have the same symptoms. How, and how so they're kind of at their wits end. How did you get into that, Julie? Well, I'm, I learned how to connect with spirit. Once you connect with spirit, you can do it all. Mm. And so that's why I say I'm a buffet of psychicness. And that's what I teach is did you always I don't have think a, it needs to be siloed. Yeah. Did you always have an interest? No, I though? learned. You just, it just came, I it learned. just was part of the curiosity and part of the process of your learning. You didn't think, oh, well, I'd love to learn about medical conditions. No, I'm an inventor of surgical devices sold throughout the world, uh -huh. and a former manufacturer, and I've I've, I'm a serial entrepreneur. And so I was always interested in medical stuff. And then when I heard about the medical healing, the you energetic know. healing, I thought, ah, what's that? I need to check that out and see what happens. Tell me about how you do what you do. What's your what's my process? protocol or, or what's your process? Better word. What's your process? When somebody comes to you, do they have normally somebody with whom they want to connect or they just want to see what you come up with or all mm. of the above? What's the, what's a normal client look like and how do you, how do you work with them? It's different all the time. I really do work in the moment with the person that's in. So I feel the, my, my, my process is the minute I sit down in this chair, I connect with spirit. And my process is different depending on who sits in the chair opposite me. So I will ask if somebody's had an experience before, do they know what to expect? You know, what has their experience been? And then I'll sort of share with them, well, there might be some different quirks to my mediumship that's different because every medium works differently. I get a lot of mannerisms. I get a lot of, um, you know, so the guy that rocks in a chair might rock in a chair. The person that wants to lean might lean. I don't want you to be shocked by anything you experience. I want you to understand that it's only unconditional love. It's only your loved one that's trying to get something evidential through. And sometimes 
the gestures can be more evidential than anything that I say, because you know your loved one, you know their habits, they know yours, they want to take them account of you as well. We can have a lot of fun just with gestures alone, you know? And, uh, you know, I had a brilliant one, actually. There's a lady who, she's deaf. She comes to my house. I'm very sympathetic with the deaf because I'm slightly deaf in one ear. And um, her, she brought, she'd had a reading. She, she brought her son for a reading. And the sister started signing to have, I don't know sign language. I don't have a clue what she's doing with my hands. <laughs> but she's telling him, stop smoking, too much partying. <laughs> it's just like... And I'm like, what is she saying? Well, you know, I can't even remember the hand signals. What is she saying? Why are you la- Why are you looking scared? <laughs> she's, saying, she's saying, she's telling me to stop smoking and, and to stop partying too much. I haven't told my mum that I smoke. <laughs> you know, like, um, and so there's these moments. Busted. Where, you know, busted. But like, I haven't got control of that. I, I don't know sign language, so I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, so there's sometimes the kids are funny, aren't they? They're just funny. They want to have a laugh. But I, so I, I sit down in the chair and I just say to people look be open sometimes it can start a little bit vague and it builds up and we might not know or understand straight away instantly what's going on I just have to describe the experience that I'm having and hopefully it starts to tell the story of what you've come here to hear and experience but if they are open-minded and their connection is good then we get this lovely dialogue that comes and it is a dialogue I see things hear things get taste get smells get mannerisms you're moving through different experiences and emotions and just sharing those. So that's kind of my experience in a one-to-one. In a, in a gallery, it's slightly different. Sometimes I'll throw information out. They'll give me a checklist of information to share, to identify the person. Sometimes they'll make me go direct and I'll say to you, who do you want to hear from? And then I'll connect to that vibration and start to read that way. And sometimes they'll give me who, who it is that they want to read for. So I kind of, uh, work in different ways depending on the audience and and how I feel and sometimes I want to change it up to keep people's interests maybe or to work with spirit in different ways because I love different experiences I'm also a trans medium so I it's one of my favorite things to do I don't do it very frequently I don't do it over zoom I do it in a one-to-one setting and um, I, I don't just uh, do trans in terms of communication verbal communication I bring frequencies and sounds out that can create changes in people's energy um, elevate them, take them to a different level of vibration, can heal emotions and those kind of things. So I can take myself. What is a trans medium? Okay. So a what trans- is a trans medium? Yeah. So we're going into trans eight to 10 times an hour naturally. So we're all got a level of trans that we go into, but it tends to be light trans when we're daydreaming, staring outside of a window um, we get this repetitive eye movement that goes on and we, we go into this moment where we'd like daydreaming or accessing information from our subconscious mind, if you will. And so a moment of trance is just an altered state of awareness. And we do have altered states of awareness in mental mediumship. But what we do in in, in sort of trans mediumship is the blend is a little bit more. You You give a little bit more control to the spirit world. And it's not that you're out cold, that, that, you know, physical mediums sometimes go to very deep states of awareness, but actually deep doesn't mean good. You can get very good trance in very light and mid states and actually sometimes better, I think, because in deeper states, you're just comatose, <laughs> just out cold, you know, um, but what you're doing is you're allowing spirit to have more control over your physical elements of your uh, your your gestures. Your they're blending deeper, and so what I find is that the the energy shifts and you take on more of their personality and their feeling. But also sometimes they can bypass some of my vocabulary and use their own, and it's still me. I've still got an awareness that I'm there, I'm listening, I'm aware. Some, sometimes if they're really funny, I find myself being pulled out because I start laughing with them at what they're doing. I, there was a lady on my retreat where her son was taking the mick out of a, a, a shaving device she'd bought. He was a real cheeky little monkey, is Adam. And he was he was taking the mick out of this sh- shaving device that she'd just bought. And I was blindfolded. I didn't have a clue who was in the chair. You know, my, my colleague was sitting people and answering for them. They were just giving thumbs up or thumbs down. And she was so that I couldn't hear their voice. I was trying to give a different level of evidence to show that I don't need to be aware of who's in the chair or who's in around because it's not me that's doing the work. And so um, 
this son was like laughing about this shaving device. He was talking to his mum about, oh, I love the new device you've got, mum. I've seen you shaving your hands. I did laugh the other day when you missed that spot and you got to work and you realised it was like a line. And he described this situation. And I think I would edit out some of those things. I'm very polite in English. In my mental mediumship, I might go, hmm. That could be a bit offensive. <laughs> I'd better rephrase it or sort of say, do you recall that you just bought this new shaving device and you were kind of using it the other day and you might have, you know, I might use my sense of humour to kind of make it a bit lighter. The kids in the spirit world that used to take the mick out of their parents in life, well, they're not like that. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna put my Englishness aside and they're just going to go for it. And he went for it. He literally, yeah. you know, ripped the mick out of his mum endlessly and she was laughing she went I knew it was my son because only my son would have the to do that you know and and that's how he was in life and it's great to know he hasn't changed but I've done mental mediumship for that lady and brought her son through before and I can tell you that the difference was substantial to when he had more control to when I had more control because I was very polite in the way that I phrased, you know, landed the words and the things that he wanted to say. I didn't amend them, but I, I maybe didn't swear as much. <laughs> I maybe didn't, you know, I was trying to be professional. And I think sometimes when we're in these trans states, you know, we've got to, it's a different level of trust, Julie. You've you've got to be prepared that you've, you're putting your 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 life in the arms of the angels. You really are. You're literally letting them lead. And when they lead, they're in charge. <laughs> they're in charge. So for me, it is a, it's an altered state of being, but it's a beautiful state of being when you've got lovely personalities to work with. You get this lovely richness of character that comes through. And, you know, I'm still learning. I, I don't think you ever stop being the student yourself. I every time I do a demonstration like that where spirit got more control, I learn something new. And so for me, that's also really important. I don't want to stay static in my mediumship. I want to be constantly going out for more. And I, I think that's what keeps you interested in what you're doing and passionate about what you're doing because you're going out of your comfort zone. I, I don't know if you agree. Have you ever done trans yourself? Uh, no, I <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't. But I find, especially with the medical stuff, you'll hear me say, "Oh, this is cool. I haven't seen this before." Because a lot of the times, the healings that I get to see, something getting added, something getting removed. I watch procedures all the time that emulate what I saw in surgery for all those years, developing products, testing prototypes, things like that. Sometimes I see healings that use methodologies and devices that haven't been invented before. Oh, wow. And so that appeals to the inventor brain inside of me. And I'm thinking, oh, cool. This isn't, I haven't seen this before. Wow, this is interesting. And then it's interesting, Kat, because then I'll see it many more times. It's kind of like, okay, here's a new healing. You know what it is. And then in inevitably there will be many other people that will show up that I'll watch the same healing happen. Oh, that's really and after cool. doing it tens of thousands of times, I know what a lot of them are. I know if something's identified, I know what the healing is going to be. Sometimes there will be a nuance about it, but but I'm describing. Oh, wow. What so I'm you seeing. diagnose and then you heal as well? <clears throat> yes. Something's Wonder. diagnosed and then there's a healing immediately. And then I'll make several swipes through the person. Like I'll get a checklist first and they'll say, I'll say, okay, when I get you on my radar, I go in blind first because I want to see where the energy goes because it may identify something that's asymptomatic and we're heading off a problem at the pass before it becomes a problem. Mm. And then they'll give me a list. Okay, my left knee hurts, my right wrist hurts, my whatever hurts. And then I'll, I'll go to each one of those places more from a time management standpoint than anything so we can get as much crammed into our hour together as possible. So we may talk to their dead grandma, we may scan them medically and talk to their pet and do career advice and whatever. It's just a oh, plethora wow. of things off of my buffet of psychicness is what and, I call it. And so when people come to you and they've come skeptical and they've transformed by this experience, do you find then that they're like, they're transformed in their spirit as well as their 
you know, their psyche or the physical world? Do they come back? Do you do they refer people then? Then you get to meet them again further down the line. It, like, how, I mean, what's their reaction when they come in skeptical and they think, yeah. oh, you know, I'm crazy. Like, very much so. Yeah. Very, very much so. And it's it, it's fun because sometimes I'll have spirit that will recommend me to somebody. Oh, wow. I had a client one time and he was a commercial airline pilot in lived in Hawaii. And he said, I, and I said, well, how did we get introduced? And he said, my grandmother told me about you. And I said, oh, who's your grandmother? And he said, well, you wouldn't know her. And I said, okay. I'm thinking, okay. And he said, she died 20 years ago. He said, she came to me in a dream and she said, you need to do, you need to call Julie Ryan. <laughs> and he said, I said to her in my dream, oh, who in the hell is Julie Ryan? <laughs> he, said, That's and he looked me up. That's online brilliant. and he said and I scheduled an appointment with you because and I said I love it when dead people are doing my marketing for me it's great you <laughs> know nice. from heaven That's how it should be and it? then a lot of the time I'll have not a lot but a percentage of the time I'll have usually it's a husband or a boyfriend yeah. and their wife or their girlfriend will have made the appointment and they'll say you you know just show up here at this time and talk to this woman and so I'll, and so I'll explain to them okay here's what your wife got you into <laughs> and they're usually very good spirits about it and usually I'll nail something that there's no way I could have known yeah, either brilliant. we're talking to a deceased loved one or we're doing a medical thing or we're doing a past life thing. Past lives are so much fun because we can get information that we can corroborate with historic documents online, That's which is really fun to do those. So yeah. everybody's different. I find too, it's interesting to me about the sign language thing with you because I hear things in English so I can understand it, even if it's somebody who in life didn't speak English. Mm. And people will ask me, well, do you speak Farsi or do you speak Swahili or whatever? Mm. And I'll say no, but the information comes to me in English. And I find that symbols are the universal language of spirit. Yeah, I'd say I see emotion is I, as well. I don't need. Emotion I don't too. necessarily need to know you. I understand the language of emotion and feeling, and so they'll talk to me through the language of emotion and feeling, or show me things in a way through my own vocabulary. I don't speak Japanese, but I have an awareness of the things that they enjoy through my own experiences. They'll find the similarities mm -hmm. or the differences, and they'll point them out to me. So sometimes, sometimes mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie. There are occasions when some cultures can be harder to to read mm -hmm. um, because of the understanding barrier between the living, not actually the disincarnate and the living. It's actually the disincarnate are very tuned in. It's actually our communication barrier that can actually halt the energy, I think, sometimes. And then there are other times when you can sit together and you've got no language, but you know exactly what the other person's saying. And the communication flows really beautifully. So again, I you know, right. there isn't a one set rule, is there? It's, it's very dependent on any moment in any given day and the person that sits in front of you, I think. Uh, I've had situations too where I'm helping find lost people or Ooh, helping find too. other things. And I'll get, it, it, it'll be in a different country where I don't speak the language. So I'll either get a translation or sometimes I will get the latitude and longitude coordinates. Oh, that's amazing. And those will come through. And I even have gotten information about certain satellites that are used for communication. I don't know the oh, name of satellites, wow, but then I can give you the cord. I can give you the coordination of where they are, you know, in space so that that satellite can be identified, oh, wow. which is interesting. And then, so and then cool. the other thing I find too is, and see if you agree with this, I find that spirit's very literal. The, like your guide, you know, talking about his mom shaving. I find that, that the more concise we can be in the questions that we ask to spirit, the more applicable the information will be that we receive and oh, can... Yeah. And yeah. convey to the person because percepted perception and perspective are so important. And I use the example a lot, Kat, of 
if if you ask your deceased grandmother, hey, grandma, are we going to watch, are we going to enjoy watching the movie? And you hear yes in your head. And then you're watching some movie tonight. And it's awful. <laughs> and you're thinking, grandma, what's up with that? Well, the way you ask the question could pertain to any movie you're going to watch throughout the rest of your life. Oh, Whereas yeah, if you yeah, say, but- hey, grandma, <laughs> are we going to enjoy watching Frozen 2 on Disney Plus tonight on you know the Disney Plus channel? That's very specific. And so I always say the information that our loved ones or, and you don't even have to have known the person to communicate with them. I always say, who do you want to talk to? Elvis or whoever, it doesn't matter. You just think of them and we connect to them. But I say it's how applicable the information is, is always predicated on how we ask the question. Yeah. If we're looking for information. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really yeah, important, absolutely. actually. Sometimes, I bet you've had this as well, where people will come and they'll sit in front of you. They've got a list of questions and the spirit world have already preempted them. <laughs> they've already answered them. And they went, okay, so have you got any questions? And they look at me and they go, well, actually, you answered in the first five minutes. Everything <laughs> was on my list. And you're like, oh, they're good, aren't they? They're good. And you just yeah, sort of like smile. Exactly. So, yeah, that's, exactly. That's a good day. I got a couple of other questions for you before we wrap up. Um, the first one is you say that source is a wave that moves through you, mm. a sound, a frequency, vibration. What does that mean? Ooh, Can you explain yeah, that? What's really that mean? So I think we're all vibrational beings, like reacting to vibration. I, I think maybe the primordial, you know, a lot of people talk about love and light, but actually I think they overlook sound, that this primordial force of nature, you know, at the beginning there was a word, you know, maybe that word was on, I don't know. Um, but when I, so I had a really, really strange experience. I was asked by spirit to go to India and I didn't know I was going to be sent there for a, a festival called Maha Shivarati which is the festival of Shiva, the god of Kundalini. And it was to open up my throat chakra, which I didn't even know was blocked. Um, I'd had an opening of the heart <laughs> in my diving accident and worked at that level for 11 years. And <laughs> they were taking me, they said I had to go to this this retreat. And they were laughing because I was like, well, send me the money. <laughs> because, you know, and they were like, well, you've been, we've been asking you to go for five years. And for five years, you've been saying you haven't got the time. Now you've got the time you're saying you haven't got the money. We'll send you the money. <laughs> Just go. And sure enough, the next day in the post, an insurance thing that I didn't even know I was expecting paid out and it was just the amount of money for this trip that they wanted me to do so I was like well I didn't have it yesterday I won't lose it tomorrow if I just do it there's obviously something at play so I took I took that 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 sort of little crumb and I followed the the cookie uh, crumbs all the way to India and I was in Goa and um, I had this really amazing experience on the night of Maha Shivarati we'd been doing some breath work during the day we'd done yoga and I was due to have this massage that was given to everybody that went to the retreat and it was a very particular type of massage that worked on the stomach area and as the as as I went into the centre, the girl said to me, um, I looked at the girl and I said, oh, are you a trance healer? And she said, what's a trance healer? And I said, uh, you're an energy healer as well as a masseur. And she said, no. And I said, hmm, that's weird. <laughs> My trance guide's here and they only ever come when there's a trance healing or trance work to be done. And I'm not planning to go into trance. So I'm wondering if it's for you. And she looked at me and I was like, mm, hang on a minute, they're saying the word fear to me. And I can hear them saying uh, that they want to tell you how to do the therapy or the massage today. If they instruct you what to do, would you mind doing what they say? They clearly knew that she would. <laughs> um, and she said, OK. And I said, OK, they're saying press here, massage here. And suddenly we heard this noise. <sighs> like this and I was like oh, what is that it was so loud it was so loud she went, I don't know I, th- I think that's a block of energy moving and I said well now they're saying press here and massage here and say oh, it got louder and it, it, this happened for about half an hour going all the way down one side of the stomach and then suddenly it hit the bottom chakra and it went flying so sort of, that's the bottom of the pelvis for anybody that doesn't know about chakras and it flew right up this energy sort of went right up and then the throat was like like this and that's when these kind of sound frequencies started coming out and I was like oh my god I've never been able to sing my mum always said to me you know the power of belief is really true she said oh you're a terrible singer you can't sing and so I believed her (laughs) 
<laughs> to believe that I could sing. I've never been able to sing. I've never been able to hit a, a, a note in tune. And then suddenly, here I am singing opera, <laughs> literally um, hitting notes that Beyonce would die to, 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 to make. And I'm like, what is, I was like, what is this? Right. And I felt a bit sort of, sub, you know, self-conscious. So I said to the girl, I said, oh, they want to do something now in trance. And I feel really embarrassed. And I was like, um, you can stay and listen if you want to, because she was like, oh, these sounds are really lovely. Like, what is this? Are you a singer? And I said, no, no, I'm not. And I said, would you mind awfully? Wow. You just sat outside. I'm quite happy for you to listen, but I just want to draw the curtains and see what this is about and sort of explore it <laughs> privately for a moment, because I'm a little bit embarrassed. And um, and so I did. I just went, I let them take over in trance and do what they wanted to do. And this amazing healing happened that opened up my throat. And these sounds started coming. And what was really amazing, these little insights that spirit do, the next day, unbeknown to me, uh, uh, an aura photographer was coming to the retreat. And he must have looked at me and he must have thought, middle-aged woman, <laughs> English, looks a bit boring. Um, and I walked in front of the camera and he went, <gasps> oh my god <laughs> and I was like hello and he was like who are you and I said what do you mean he went wow your aura is cosmic your brain waves what are you doing with your brain I said what do you mean what am I doing with my brain I was like it's in my head I'm just walking in and he was like no like look at this come look at my camera he said I've never seen frequency waves like this in the brain and I went oh it must be the singing I said watch this so I started to sing <laughs> And I was like, I've been playing with it overnight. I said, it just happened yesterday. I don't really know what it is, but I realized that the voice box is under the brain. And so we've got a natural ability to heal ourselves. We, these, we've, we've gone away from some of the primal um, abilities. You know, we carry everything we need in our body and we don't utilize it because we don't know what it's for. <laughs> you know, the voice we think is just to speak, but actually it can make frequencies that can heal. And so we're vibrational frequencies. And so when I say, um, when I talk about spirit and, and, and source as a wave of energy, that's what I mean. I think, you know, even the table in front of me is um, is energy, but it's a denser, thicker energy. And so it seems solid to me, but to the spirit world, they can see right through that table. It doesn't look solid to them. That's my mind telling me, you know, and the physical telling me it's solid. Right. In, in the spirit world, they can see right through it and tell you what it's made of and what's underneath it and what's around it. And, you know, had people from the spirit world say, well, your keys are under that sofa. And I said, oh, well, how do you know the keys are under the sofa? And they say, well, I can see right through the sofa and you've just looked right past it. It's there. <laughs> so so I, I find it fascinating. But I, so I think we're, we are vibrational beings with that. We've got a, a, you know, a frequency that we're radiating at and energy and, you know, right, Reiki and all these different types of Reiki, you get fire Reiki, normal Reiki, theta healing, all these different energy healings. They're all coming from source. Of course they are, but they're different qualities of energy or channels of power that that affect your frequency or vibration and i think we can bring ourselves into resonance with one another using sound we can we can find harmony we can we can we can heal and, and so for me vibration is very powerful and part of the work i agree What's the Transcending Grief Project? Okay. So Transcending Grief actually was born out on my birthday at the Helping Parents Heal Conference in Arizona. It was the day after the conference. I had done a reading for a young lady called Paige Lee on day one. And I'd only actually met her for an hour. I mean, this is the power of spirit. I'd only actually met her for an hour about two years prior to this in an interview. And um, I, suddenly I realized that as I was uh, speaking to her, that her a lady that she knew in spirit, a lady called Sally Baldwin, who used to run retreats, was present with her. And I said, hey, Paige, there's a lady with you. And I started to read for her. And I said, oh, um, this lady's saying that you were going to pack in some retreats or something, but she's going to give me some information at the retreat for you about some retreats that she wants to do. And actually, you're not going to pack them in. They're going to get bigger or you're going to do more of them. And so I think you need to rethink your strategy. And not thinking for one minute I was going to get involved with uh, that retreat or that work in, in any way, shape or form. And um, I 
I think it was my birthday. I actually, uh, Dr. Dreffer Driscoll, who was at the conference, had invited, he said, can I take you for breakfast for, uh, you know, for your birthday? And I said, I'd love you to take me for breakfast for my birthday. The only problem, Jeff, is that I, um, I've got a client that I need to check in with and and say hello to because they're expecting to see me I, I need to be able to say hello to them and uh you know I, i've worked with them all these years i haven't actually ever met them so i was like they want to meet me and uh, i i did say that i would be free on my birthday in the morning believe it or not because i'm crazy and um he said oh, i have a feeling that it'll it'll get changed you're meant to come for breakfast with me I, i'll come and get you in the morning and i laughed at him saying no dad i've had him on the show he's brilliant I've it? had him on the show. He's a riot. He is. Yeah, he's he's an absolutely guy. hilarious, actually. I have a nickname for him. I won't, I won't yeah. embarrass him with my nickname, but we, we have a lot of fun together. So I, I said, um, anyway, as it should happen, the person said, actually, I've got COVID. <laughs> and so I can't come and eat for breakfast. So I was like, oh, Jeff, what is it with you? It looks like I'm coming for breakfast with you. So I ended up going to breakfast and we were talking about art and it turns out that he's a very talented artist he does bronze statues and beautiful artworks and this day I said I, I bet you've done one of the Archangel Michael and he said I have how did you know I've just finished and I went ah because I'm a medium like come on then show me the picture show me the the bronze statue so he got the statue out and we were talking about St Michael and St Mary when this girl came over and she said oh, are you Kat Bailey? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And she said, I don't really want to interrupt yours and your your breakfast, but do you mind if I just uh, speak to you for a moment? I said, sure. She said, you know, I run, I have a retreat centre and I run retreats and I we would love, you know, we're looking for a trans medium. I heard you're a trans medium. Would you love to come and work at this retreat? I said, oh, that sounds amazing. Where is it? And she said, it's in St. Michael's in Maryland. <laughs> and I burst out laughing. And me and Jeff were like, oh. And then I went, oh, no, it's not for me. The information's not for me. It's for Paige. I'll get you the information. This is for Paige. Somebody said they were sending me some information and some retreats. Give me your details. I'll pass it on. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. You see, we, we kind of wanted, wondered if you would come. And I said, well, I, I might, I might, but I have to ask Paige. I know that I've got to get some information for Paige. And it kind of started like that. And then it got us talking and we thought, actually, we could do something. We could pull our skills together. She's a grief educator and author in the USA. And I could bring, you know, the the skills that Spirit have given me in terms of, you know, not just mediumship, clinical hypnotherapy, Reiki healing, sound therapy. I wanted to experiment with the power of sound in groups. I wanted to do some more trans experiments. So we decided to 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 host a retreat. And uh, and that's how it started. And then organically, without really thinking, it became a Facebook page. It's now in January about to become a website. And it's about really holding space for people and just keeping communication going. And I love the work that we do for helping parents heal, but that same message needs to get to people who've lost parents, that have lost, uh, you know, widows and widowers. And so what I see my next sort of journey or part of the role as being is taking the knowledge that helping parents heal have helped nurture within me to a wider audience and to utilize that to touch more people. And so this is the beginning of that process. There are other things that I'm doing, but I will keep doing my my normal work. But this for me is about giving back. It's about, you know, more about the education piece and the teaching, which mm -hmm. I always have done, but perhaps not as in a uniformed way. I, I know you teach in a very uniformed way and you've got some consistency. I think I just dip in and dip out. And this is about giving me a more consistent opportunity to share, I think. So yeah, Transcending Wonderful. Grief is about going well, above and finding a new perspective on grief, really. And it's about, it's a little Facebook group at the moment. You're more than welcome to join. You'll find us on Facebook. But in January, there will be a website, I promise you. So just watch this space. Terrific. One last question. Why do you think we incarnate? Why do you think we incarnate? That's a great question. I'd like to believe it's about learning about recognizing the spirit or the soul within ourselves, getting to know ourselves, but also to know spirit as well. So I think that the body is 
almost like a house or a chalice, if you will, that allows the spirit and the soul to rub off one another and to experience itself as part of itself. And so I think it's a funny little game that we're playing of getting to know different elements of ourselves and experience ourselves in a different way. I also think it's a dense of vibration here on earth. So I think things are slowed down for us. You know, time doesn't exist. Everything happens at once in the spirit world. But here we get to slow things down and to experience things that perhaps we don't notice or kind of take in the same level of detail of in the spirit world. So I think this is just about seeing things from a different perspective, having a different experience of something. It's a little bit like when you're playing games and you put on the, you know, the um, special 3D goggles and stuff, you're seeing things in a different perspective in a different way and through a different lens. So I think we we come to have experiences, we come to connect with one another, we come to learn from one another and learn different aspects of the spirit and soul. And it's through the work that we're doing is we're raising our vibration and we're changing the frequency that we ourselves resonate at. And so we're learning how to calibrate vibration, manage energy. And I think that's part of the, the earth life experience is about learning different ways to experience vibrational energy. Um, so I, I love the little acronym for love, you know, levels of, of energy, level, levels of energy, vibrational energy. That's what we all are, levels of vibrational energy. I haven't heard that. I love that. Mm, it's beautiful, isn't levels it? Levels of vibrational energy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Wow. Good place to conclude. Absolutely. How can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, they can go to my website, which is www.cat-b.com. Um, or they can email me at me, Jim Cat B. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm, I'm terrible. I have to be honest. I have the, um, I'm really awful. People go, don't they? Oh, I've got X amount of followers and stuff like that. I'm not really into it. I'm a really old fashioned girl in some ways. And um, when people say they want to put me on Google or kind of do all these kind of analytics behind the surface, I say, what for? Spirit will send. <laughs> Who's supposed to find me when they're supposed to find me at the right time that they're supposed to find me, if they're meant to find me. <laughs> you know? So I'm, I kind of have been used by this idea of getting yourself out there. I said, I don't, you know, my waiting list is 10 months already. I don't to go to three years or five years i'm quite happy the way that i am um but but it, I'm, I'm just teasing aside you can find me on my facebook and you can find me on my website um that's the best way to get hold of me i'm often on helping parents heal like you as well if you're a brood parent you'll see me there do demonstrations i love to have a chat you can find me on transcending grief so i'm there every week I love to do live chats and talks with people, not often recorded. I don't do formal podcasts or anything, but you can get access to me maybe far quicker, actually, sometimes on Transcending Grief because Paige, my other half, is is a good taskmaster. She keeps me in line and makes sure, look, come on, you had, you had a, somebody was trying to get hold of you. You haven't got back to them, like, you know, so she'll give me a little nudge in the right direction. She's good like that. So, um, yeah, I think they're the best ways to kind of get hold of me. Okay. What a delight. Oh, you are just you. an absolute delight. And I look forward to meeting you in person someday. Yeah, at absolutely. One of the events. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be fun. It'd be really so, nice, Julie. And everybody, anytime you're in London, please do look me up. I would love to meet you in person. It'd I be will. Amazing. I certainly will. Everybody, sending you lots of love from Sweet Home, Alabama. Mwah! And from London, too, where Kat is. Hope you have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time. Oh, thank you so much, Judy. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Julie on Instagram and YouTube at Ask Julie Ryan and like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. To schedule an appointment or submit a question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com. This show is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical, psychological, financial, or legal advice. Please contact a licensed professional. The Ask Julie Ryan Show, Julie Ryan and all parties involved in producing, recording, and distributing it assume no responsibility for listeners' actions based on any information heard on this or any Ask Julie Ryan shows or podcasts.